Hey everyone, we're here. Thanks to everyone that's showing up and um, it feels so sweet to see community and feel that sense of community. And we're also extending our that sense of community to you, those who are practicing with us um, after the fact on the YouTube recording. I hope you feel um, welcomed and a sense of presence with us. We're extending our awareness to you as well. Um, an interesting thing popped up today. It's, it's so interesting to me how these little threads of themes show up and it's like, oh, and then I looked on my desk and I had a poem about loneliness and whatever, all these things were just like right there. Okay, that's what it is tonight. Someone told me today uh, that I had never heard of before that some governments are now, have been and are and more are considering it. Uh, have um, ministries or a, um, a ministerial body in their government um, for loneliness, a minister of loneliness. What? That's so amazing and so good and so... <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, I was floored to hear this. Um, so I did a little bit of digging into it. And it coincided with something else that I had just recently seen or saved, what, maybe yesterday. Was it this morning? I think it was yesterday um, on Instagram, Instagram Dharma tonight. Uh, and I'll I'll put the names and the links to some of these articles and um, people that I'm referencing down below in the in the YouTube blurb. So check those out if you want more more information. So where to begin this thread? <clears throat> I'll start where where it popped up for me and uh, lead us into the Dharma. Hopefully. So the Instagram person, uh, her name is Kim Morrison, and her Instagram tag is the Hoog Gathering. That's spelled H-Y-G-G-E. It's a Danish word concept principle, but it's, uh, as, as she says, it's pronounced Hoog. H O O G A H is like it's pronounced that way. So I'm trying to correctly pronounce it. I hope it's close. It's a, uh, and so her channel is all about this philosophy, this way, it's a concept. It's, and uh, she says it this way on her website it's a Scandinavian concept that emphasizes being intentionally present. That's Dharma. Practicing gratitude, Dharma. And embracing simplicity, Dharma. The uh, renunciation is something that's spoken about like 75 or 80 percent of suttas, I would say, speak about renunciation, which is about letting go and simplicity. It's about so much more is a very big important part of the practice but uh, simplicity would be part of it so huh, in her in her post and on her uh, site this uh, Kim Morrison made a little Instagram clip about an alternative, uh, 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 something that's being researched more and and was, the I think, the first I'd heard of it, another re response to stress. So 
our nervous system, especially in times of trauma, but also just in terms of, uh, <laughs> we kind of have chronic levels of stress, not kind of, we do have chronic levels of stress now. Most cultures in, to the extent that it's become a medical specialty, the interrelatedness of body, heart, mind, energy, and the impacts of stress on many aspects of our health, mental and physical health and emotional. So because the, this animal system is designed to survive and has these um, automatic responses when under stress, meaning danger. So these are ways to survive as an animal. And these are, you've heard of fight, flight, and freeze are the most common ones. So the, there's a, a whole, there's a whole lot about this, these systems and how, and how, how they shut down some systems in the body and activate others, elevate the heart rate, elevate our blood pressure, elevate our muscular tension, and these have all kinds of physiological responses. So the, the animal part of our being is ready to either to fight or to flee or freeze, you know, like a, a possum <laughs> freeze response. And for those of us, who have survived trauma. Uh, these are well-known coping mechanisms and safety mechanisms that have uh, maybe become habituated as well. So in uh, this post, uh, she was introducing what was an introduction to me of a fourth stress response, fight, flight, freeze, are three of them. And then the fourth is um, what they call tend or befriend. <laughs> and um, it's so beautiful. <laughs> and they, a lot of the studies that I was finding really put a lot of gender spin on it, which I think they just need to do more studies <laughs> because it's not that linear um, being assigned to female gendered people. Uh, I don't believe that. Uh, but these are what they currently are ascribing. And so the this is a stress response that can be learned because we have uh, adaptability and neuroplasticity that when uh, when the system is activated, the nervous system is activated as it is, or I would say all of us to some degree, we have this other possibility to connect to others, to tend, it may be tending to more vulnerable people or to younger people. It's this tending, you know, they're ascribing it to a maternal instinct uh, to tend to children, um, but it doesn't need to be that limited. It, it's just tending, taking care um, of others. And this, and then befriending is, is, connecting, gathering in, you know, creating friendships, befriending. And in the, in the concept of Hug, the Scandinavian concept, the ideal gathering size is said to be three to four people. And they say this apparently because it's cozy enough to be seen without the pressure of feeling on the whole time. You know, if it's just a dyad or two people, then you're like, it, 
there isn't a way to just rest back, you know, or there's this feeling pressure of uh, socializing, which isn't comfortable for lots of folks. So maybe this uh, befriending or gathering is ideally perhaps in, um, you know, this kind of size of group. In a really big group, you can just feel kind of lost and even more alone. Yeah. So um, tending or befriending decreases the stress hormone cortisol and increases oxytocin, um, happy hormones, if we want to really simplify the language. Yeah. And when one as a perhaps as a young person or as a child perhaps um, felt overwhelmed or unsafe that we might have taken on the the truth or the understanding or the feeling that being alone is safer or a way of coping is to isolate and um, our bodies, our nervous system may have learned that it's safer to be in solitude, um, especially. And so when we are back in a time of crisis or fear or activation of our nervous system, then that old groove is going to come back in and we might isolate again we might fall back into that pattern <clears throat> and this is definitely acknowledging with great respect um, our inner child's ability to keep us as safe as, as possible that these were and maybe still are safety mechanisms so i'm not discounting that at all um, and it, we need to check in and see is it safe now is it possible to cultivate other ways of responding perhaps leaning and stepping finding ways to move towards tending and befriending <clears throat> So all of this is related to, I'm hearing a lot of, of folks talk about loneliness lately. Um, as a hospice volunteer, certainly seeing a lot of loneliness and especially for folks that are grieving. Um, and I, I think there's still some residue from the pandemic of isolation and loneliness that um, might have become habituated for folks. Um, yeah, different different kinds of loneliness. And so it's interesting that mm -hmm, it's very interesting that even a, a government with its very different priorities is saying, hmm, this is actually a thing we need to attend to because of the implications. There's huge physical and mental health implications, uh, complications uh, from loneliness. So in, in uh, 2018, um, former U UK Prime Minister Elizabeth May uh, started, was the first that, I, uh, that I've heard of, um, that launched the world's first ministerial lead to tackle loneliness. Uh, she was quoted as saying, it's an official response to one of the greatest public health challenges of our time. That, wow. <laughs> That's heartbreaking. So many, there's so many people. We're surrounded, you know, there's people everywhere all the time. And how are we not connecting? How are we not reaching out and tending? 
Hmm. So, um, yeah, I won't, I'll try not to go too far down that road. Um, so since then, Japan has also followed the UK's lead and has um, uh, Office for Policy on Loneliness and Isolation, and they're doing more studies, a lot more research needs to be done, but instituting specific uh, responses to this problem and uh, really understanding really vast implications of it it's not just it's not just loneliness as a thing it has all these impacts on our health um let me just see pull out some of these threads so they're they're starting more you know social prescribings and link workers you know um community connectors well-being advisors community navigators, health advisors on non-clinical needs, all kinds of stuff. And, of, and understanding the, the, what's that word, intersectionality of um, poverty and loneliness, that there's a, a, a lack of affordable housing causes people to have to move or live somewhere where they don't have uh, established communities, where they may have had established communities and they might have to leave that to get affordable housing. We know that about the housing crisis that's happening. And for others, um, they may be in cramped housing conditions that make it hard for them to cultivate like to have social gatherings in their place if it's not conducive to that um one who is this person that it's a, a government official i should give their name ba, ba, ba. not finding it easily so this person uh they did an inquiry um and they say this, when designing new housing developments and transportation, groups at risk of loneliness and exclusion should be consulted. Yes. Simple things like putting in more benches, putting seating in apartment block corridors, communal gardens, warm lighting can help neighborhoods connect. Um, the highlighted the role of lobbies and shared outdoor spaces and lounges access to the nearest bus stop, ensuring that all residents have some access to play areas, for instance. So many uh, benches now in our communities have like bars across them, you know, uh, so you can only seat uh, a few people so that someone can't lay down there, someone that's in need of rest and housing. Uh, you know, so creating these kind of spaces where people can can gather and feel connected and feel this sense of befriending. It's um, yeah, pretty interesting to to look at this growing movement and the implications of it. Um, and in the the Dharma, the Buddha uh, says this. This is in the Samyutta Nikaya 45.2, if, if you're one that likes to follow suttas. And uh, this is um, Venerable Ananda is speaking, who is like mm, the Buddha's closest companion. And uh, I think he was also his cousin. Venerable Ananda approached the Buddha and sat down to one side after offering, paying homage to him. And he said, Bhante, this is half of the spiritual life. That is good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship. Not so, Ananda, the Buddha said. Not so, Ananda, not so, Ananda. 
This is the entire spiritual life. That is good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship. That is not half the spiritual life. The Buddha said this is the entire spiritual life. Wow. He goes on to say that when a monk he's talking about, but when somebody on this path has a good friend, a good companion, a good comrade, it is to be expected that they will develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path. So it's seen that part of being a good friend, a good companion, a good comrade, um, means that we uh, have wise intention and skillful speech and wise action and the rest of the whole Eightfold Path, wise mindfulness, wise effort, all these things. So, you know, is one actually being a able to be a, a good companion, a good befriender, a tender of, of fellow beings without being on some sort of path of cultivating wisdom and kindness. So they're interrelated. They inter are. Hmm. Just seeing if there's any other bits here. Mm. So uh, Kim Morrison in her post on Instagram uh, is encouraging us to stretch into some bravery, uh, to step into some... Uh, yeah, bravery. Um, and we might do this by starting with one person, you know, that we can't overhaul our whole nervous system at once, most certainly. Um, you know, it, it, is there one person that you could just, even if it's like in a in a shop, you know, you're in line at a grocery store, it's like to say something kind or friendly to the salesperson. Um, or it could be you, to begin cultivating this with a therapist um, or a somatic therapist, someone who understands the nervous system and, and the body. And, and to use that as like a training ground to improve our ability to connect with others and communicate and reach out in these ways and and to begin inviting people into the messy parts of of these heart body minds very messy um allow ourselves ways to um to cultivate these these ways that uh, calm and soothe and heal our nervous systems and our whole heart, body, mind. The Buddha says it's the whole of the spiritual life. That's pretty high praise. So we will uh, cultivate our practice of connecting with others by connecting with this, our most intimate life partner, this being. You know, uh, how can we be a true friend and companion when we're not friending, befriending ourselves? Uh, and this is also what the Buddha taught about metta and loving kindness, that it begins with ourselves. Um, or, and and continues from there, doesn't just end there, uh, 
but there's a I should have looked that up, but there's another sutta that says Yeah, I wish I had the right wording. There is uh, there is no one more worthy of loving kindness than yourself. So it's not meaning others aren't worthy. It means that you are as worthy as all beings. Okay, so we will begin tending and befriending this dear one. Um in our practice tonight. All right, so let's uh, adjust your practice space to begin to prepare for meditation. Mm, that is good water. Mm, so as you're settling into your practice this evening. Mm, because we're, we're talking tonight about the nervous system and its habitual protections, it might be helpful to really take a look. Um, somatic practitioners mm, say the importance of this to actually turn your head and uh, it's also good for your nervous system to turn your head and look around your space and acknowledge like where's the doors and the exits see if your space feels safe is it do do you have a sense of safety where you are or a sense of um, ease or peace or calm or beauty Perhaps there's a window that's helpful to gaze out of. And so that when you, when you feel ready for stillness, take your time with that. You might need some other stretches or movement or touch so that you're not hurrying into a meditative posture you know, just being still and closing your eyes, really see uh, if you need anything else before you feel ready to settle. <sighs> so that when you land, mm, your central nervous system hopefully has some sense or some degree that it's okay for few, for this time of practice. That we're in a, a new place now, we're in a place where it's okay to relax. And even if that part of you is saying, no, I can't relax, can you to some degree, even if it's 2%, 5%, is there some degree of settling or calm or presence that can come? See if you feel comfortable resting your eyes. They could rest closed or just downward. Or it might be helpful for this practice to rest your eyes on something beautiful. See if it's helpful for you to take a few sighing breaths, perhaps a deeper breath in through your nose and a longer exhale through your nose or mouth. And notice if there's 
stress in the muscles of the face. So is there possibility of widening or softening the forehead? Is there some space or is there, does it feel safe enough to bring some ease into the muscles around the, the jaw or the mouth? And know that that's a choice. It's okay if it doesn't feel good. You could, you can re contain or retain that if it feels helpful. Feeling the muscles of the neck lengthen so the shoulder bones slide down away from the ears. As you take deeper breaths, do you feel some freedom or movement in the area of the chest or ribs? Inviting some width or softness or space. And then we really want to check in with the what we've practiced soft belly meditation, the, the inner layers of the belly, the muscles closer back towards the organs and towards the spine, when these are tense and contracted, they activate the nervous system in that fight or flight response. So see if the belly could receive some space or softness or ease. Even some small degree, what, whatever amount is possible, five or 10% or more. Soft belly. And as the upper body relaxes, softens a little bit, we may now feel more weightedness, heaviness, groundedness through the hips, legs, feet. If you're practicing laying down, you may feel that more through the whole back of the body. It's called Strong Back, Soft Front by Roshi Joan Halifax. And then just taking some time to open to and acknowledge that we are all affected by stress, worry, fear, doubt, perhaps loneliness. And what is our response? Do we fight? Do we flee? Do we freeze? We isolate. And 
So take some heartfelt space to connect with and thank your inner child for keeping you safe. Thank this part for protecting you. Through whatever means was necessary. And then you might feel like your 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 whole self, your present adult whole self could take their hand. Take the hand of that inner child, thanking them. And then let them know we could try something new. We're in a new place now. It's possible for us to start small and to step into tending and befriending. And we begin here just tending, befriending this most intimate life partner, yourself. No one else will ever know you better, and no one else could love you better. So just a field of presence with ourselves in stillness and silence for a few minutes here together. Just breathing, just sitting. Just relaxing. Teaching your body it's okay to relax. From this place of connection with ourselves, touch into this deepest heart wish, may I be happy. You could silently repeat that or just feel into it as a felt experience, may I be happy. May I be safe. May I be as well as possible in body and mind. May I be peaceful. May I be happy, may I be safe, may I be well, may I be peaceful.
And then we could invite in an open awareness to extend to someone that, that you know of, that you could reconnect or connect with. It could be someone that's, that you sense is lonely or isolated. It could be an elder person. It could be a, a young one that needs more support or anyone that seems vulnerable and needs more tending and care. Maybe someone that's experiencing some illness or isolation right now. And see how it feels in your nervous system as trying on this as another survival strategy, a fourth way. Fight, flight, freeze are important and necessary at times. And is it possible to stretch a little bit? Small step and what could be possible? Perhaps let yourself imagine who you might connect with, how you could reach out. We have so many ways of connecting with people. And are there ways of befriending, gathering people, perhaps a small group, three or four people, connecting for our own well-being and, of course, for the care and well-being of others? So with these folks in awareness, Opening your heart, mind, awareness, may you be happy. May you be safe. May you know wellness as much as possible. May you be peaceful. Feel this in an embodied way. How does it feel? What does it touch within your heart, body, mind? To see yourself connecting in this way. May you be happy. May you be safe. May you be well. May you be peaceful. May you feel seen. May you be cared for. May you be friended. And let the body, mind, nervous system begin to adapt to this as another survival strategy, another tool in the toolbox, another way to respond to stress. Feel and see yourself connecting.
And then lastly, we'll open to and connect to our awareness with the felt experience of so many unseen people that may live in complete isolation. And feel the threads of heart awareness connecting and cultivating our capacity. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be safe. And may you know peace. May you be peaceful. The Buddha says to Ananda, not so Ananda, not so Ananda. This is the entire spiritual life, Ananda. That is good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship. When we are a good friend, we will naturally develop and cultivate the Eightfold Path, the Middle Way, the Way to the Ending of Suffering. With our wise intentions, wise speech, wise action, wise effort and mindfulness, And lastly, return awareness to the, yourself, feeling grounded, embodied, present, relaxed. Ending and befriending yourself. May I be happy. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be peaceful. May I cultivate and open to gratitude, presence, and simplicity.
Thank you for your practice. Thank you for exploring the willingness to nudge out of our comfort zones and connect with, with others and tend to so many that are in need. Tend and befriend for our own healing and for the healing of the world and all beings. So a uh, reminder, there will be an email next week as well um, that I won't be here next week. Going to be tending and befriending with my son who's visiting briefly. And um, I'll be back again the following weeks. So that would be uh, not the 14th, but back the 21st and uh, 28th. So hope to share practice with you again. Thanks for joining us.